So when I traveled this last week, it was the first time I've traveled internationally since COVID. So it's been a couple years. And some of y'all have traveled internationally since then. And I'd heard, but now I experienced international travels just a little bit different right now. And even leading up to it, I remember there was a whole lot of red tape, things I had to do, uploading vaccine records, uploading negative tests, all kinds of paperwork and items. But really that was the half of it because then when I actually began the journey, I realized it was gonna take a lot of steps to get me to the place I was wanting to get to. Even leaving, (coughs) excuse me, from Nairobi, uh, now a day and a half ago, as I was wanting to head back to Austin, Texas, I remember when I walked into the airport, I had to have with me a QR code. And what that QR code was actually an uploaded confirmation of a negative COVID test. So before I could leave Kenya, we actually had a doctor come by and he tested all of us pastors that were traveling together. We were all negative. We had to upload that to this website that then produced a QR code that we had to take. So I had to print that QR code. And as I go through the airport, I remember I walked into the main lobby and they had to see not just my passport, but also the QR code to confirm that I was negative. Then I went through security, all my bags, everything went through. Then I went to ticketing, and they wanted to see that QR code again, and I had to show them that, and I received my ticket. Then I went to security. They wanted to see that QR code, and they also wanted to see my bags that had already been checked, so it had to go through another layer of security. Then I went to customs, and they wanted to see my passport with my QR code again, and I finally proceeded through there. Then I headed to the gate, And they wanted to check all the bags again for a third time through security, and they wanted to see that QR code once again to show that I was negative. And then finally, when I'm about to enter into the plane, I'm already wearing a mask, but they said you need to wear a different mask because it was not adequate, so they gave me another mask to wear instead. And I did all this to get on an airplane, to get to where I wanted to be, which is Austin, Texas, and it just reminded me of that truth that sometimes in life, you just have to jump through a lot of hoops and hurdles to get to where you want to go. That's just how it works. And I would argue religion has made a living off of that principle. Because if you look at every religion outside of Christianity, that is religion in a nutshell. For you to get to where you want to go, you better be prepared to jump through a whole lot of hoops and hurdles. That you have to go to this service. You have to clean yourself up in that way. You have to stop doing that. You have to start doing that. You have to serve, give, go. You have to do all this stuff to get to where you want to go. And where do we all want to go? Heaven. We want to know God here on this earth, but we want to be with him forever. And religion says you can get there. Just be prepared to go through the ringer. But Jesus Christ is better. Because Jesus tells us it's not about what you do, it's about what he's already done. And for you and I to get where we want to go, there's actually just one simple step you have to take. And it's entering into God's presence through our great high priest, through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only step we must take, but he's the only step we can take to get to heaven. And if we simply place our faith in our great high priest, we can get to where we want to be, not just one day in heaven, but we can experience heaven right now on this earth. You and I can enter into God's presence today. That that ticket's already been paid for, and you can approach him right here and right now, and you can approach him with full assurance of faith because Jesus Christ has made a way for you and I. So my question to you this morning I want you to consider is, does God feel distant in your life? Because Jesus is going to show that there's actually a very simple process to draw near to him right here in this place today. So if you have your Bible, join me in Hebrews chapter 4 is where we're going to be. Hebrews chapter 4, we're only going to read three verses. It's going to be a simple message today. Verse 14, we're told, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Just pause there for a moment, because we need to set up a little bit of context. Two weeks ago, if you were here, we were continuing this series, we're looking at this idea that Jesus is better, 
Jesus is better than any person who's ever walked on this earth. He's better than any idea, any religion, any ideology that you may follow. Christ is supreme over all. And the author of Hebrews is making this argument for us. He talks about this idea of Jesus being better. In fact, 13 times in this letter, he says that word better. And he's arguing for the supremacy of Jesus Christ, and he's arguing for it by speaking to a bunch of Hebrew Christians. He's talking to the church, but he's speaking to these converted Jews, and he's speaking in terms that they understand. Because how can he argue that Jesus is better than anyone in anything? He starts lifting up all the great things they already believed and knew. And he compares Jesus to them and shows that Jesus is better. And if you remember, so far we've seen that Jesus is better than the Old Testament prophets. That we're told long ago in many ways God spoke through many people, but in these last days, God has spoken most loudly through his son. That instead of him sending a word to man, God became man. And he spoke through his son that Jesus is better than those prophets. But then we talked about how Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. We talked about how he can lead us to a better rest than Israel could have ever found by following a man. And today what he's showing us is that Jesus is a better high priest. Because notice he called Jesus not just a high priest, he said he's a great high priest. And what he's trying to do is compare Jesus to the high priest that they already knew. And high priests were men that the Jews understood. That if you don't know how the Old Testament story works, there's this group known as the priests. And who are the priests? In a nutshell, they're middlemen, they're mediators. They're the ones that bridge that gap from Israel to God. They worked in the temple, they oversaw the sacrificial system, and they were the ones, the in-between man, to get sinful, broken people like me and you to God. But amidst them, those priests who were those mediators, there was a high priest. And he had the greatest responsibility, a responsibility ahead of all the other small priests, because this high priest had an obligation, a responsibility every year, where he had to enter into God's presence in the Holy of Holies. That there was this area known as the Holy of Holies in the temple that only one time a year man could go into, and the high priest was the man that had to enter. If you want to study how it worked, it's in Leviticus chapter 16. It's known as the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And on this day, the high priest had the obligation to mediate and to set in the middle between Israel and this righteous God. And the way he did it is he had to go to God's presence on God's terms. So what did he do? He first would offer a sacrifice for himself. We saw that in the text that we read earlier. The high priest was just a broken, normal guy. He had sin in his life, so first he would actually slaughter a bull for his own sins. And then he would have two goats that were at the center of this day of atonement. The first goat he would kill, he would offer it as a sacrifice and substitute for Israel, for all of their sins, that although they offered sacrifices all year long, there was this one goat that he would slaughter symbolically atoning for all of the sin, for the entire nation, and he would slaughter that goat. But then there was a second goat, and the second goat he didn't kill. Instead, he'd actually lay hands on that goat, and he'd start confessing all the sins of Israel just all the garbage, all the problems. And symbolically, he was transferring their guilt to that animal. And then what did he do with that goat? He sent it off into the wilderness. If you've ever heard the term scapegoat, that's actually where it comes from. We use that term when we talk about coaches that get all the blame when they don't deserve it, or a politician gets fired, he's the scapegoat. There actually is a real scapegoat. And the scapegoat got the blame for Israel's sin. And then he'd be sent off into the wilderness. And why? It's because it was to symbolically show that all of their sins were being transferred to him and taken away far from them. That now, because of this day of atonement, they could start over fresh again. And this was the high priest's job. He did this every year. He would constantly go back and he'd go through this process and when he would go through it, he would pass through doors. There'd be three sets of doors. He'd go through the outer court doors, then he'd go through the holy place doors, and then eventually he would go through that holy of holies. He'd go behind the veil into God's presence, experiencing the Shekinah glory of God. And this was his job, but what's amazing is the job kept going. 
Because he wouldn't enter in one time and be done. Instead, it'd be same time, same place, see you later. I'll do it again. In Hebrews chapter 10, the author explains why this is the case, that he'd have to pass through those doors all over again. In verse 1, he says, Since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they... Uh, otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sins but in these sacrifices there was a reminder of sins every year for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins so he says every year the high priest would pass through those doors he'd come back and do it again and why? He just told you, he said, it's impossible for the blood of animals to remove the consciousness of our sins. Actually, in Romans 2, we're told that each of us have a conscience. God put it there, that we can see that we're wrong. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, is what Jesus says, but our conscience attests to it. We know we're imperfect, every single one of us in this room. And because of that, the blood of those animals, it couldn't remove it. So every year they'd get clean, they'd get right on that day of atonement, but then the high priest would go and do it again and do it again and do it again because it couldn't remove that mess. When I travel, I kind of like going into hotels. I don't know if y'all like hotels. For me, I love them because hotels are kind of this little utopia you step into. It's like a make-believe land because you go into that room and what do you expect when you walk into a hotel room? Perfection. That's what you expect. Everything's clean. Linens are fresh. Towels are right out of the dryer. They might even have a little mint or chocolate for you. Everything's perfect. Nothing on the ground. It's spotless, clean, all right. But then what happens when you get into that hotel? You mess it up pretty good, just real quick. You start making it home is what you do, and it starts looking like your home. And I do the same, and it becomes a mess. And then after that, we leave and they clean it up again. And then someone else comes in, makes it a mess, and they clean it up again, make it a mess, clean it up again. And this is the life that the Jews lived in. They just constantly, they tried to get themselves cleaned up and they couldn't. They kept killing all these animals thinking, is this gonna fix it? And then they looked at their lives and they say, it's impossible. It's because none of us are saved by the law. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world to fulfill the law and set you free. You and I cannot remove our shame and our guilt. That's why Jesus Christ came as our great high priest. Because you see, Jesus served as everyone in that illustration. He is that first goat. Jesus Christ, his own blood was shed for you and I. He was the substitutionary sacrifice, the propitiation. He was the one put in my place and your place to atone for our sins. And his blood was slaughtered so that we wouldn't have to spill ours for our sin. That he was that first goat, but he's also that second goat. Because when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, what happens is all your shame, all your sin, all your mistakes, they're put onto Christ. That he carries your shame so that you don't have to. And when God looks at me and he looks at you and we're in faith, he sees us as blameless. That's why Paul says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He looks at us differently. It's because Jesus has carried our shame far, far away. But he's also our high priest. I like how John calls him our advocate. Because right now he's right there as the middleman. You and I can approach God Almighty through the blood of Jesus Christ, but also through the intercession of Jesus Christ that he mediates. Even right now, he's our advocate. When you and I sin, I like seeing that picture of an advocate. He's saying, Father, it's already been paid for. It's already been paid for. That's already covered. That's okay. And why is it covered? It's because our first point is true. Jesus offered the perfect sacrifice. Jesus alone offered the perfect sacrifice. All the other blood was inadequate, but Jesus' blood is perfect. He's the only one that could have done what he did. You see, man cannot offer a perfect substitute because man's blood is all tainted. All of us in this room were sinners. Every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. We can't reconcile ourselves back to God. It's an impossibility. 
That's why God had to come to earth and put on flesh because he is the perfect, spotless, blameless lamb of God and he poured out his blood and as a perfect substitutionary sacrifice. And that's why he was crucified once and for all. That he doesn't have to go back and offer other sacrifices because his sacrifice was perfect. And because of that, you and I, we no longer have to carry shame. None of us in this room if you're in Christ Jesus. Not a single one of us. Now, I do want to clarify that if you're not in Christ, if you've not placed your faith in him, you do carry shame. You do carry guilt. And you will have to deal with that to God himself because you wouldn't let Christ deal with it for you. But if you're in Christ, you no longer have to carry shame because the payment's already been paid and our sin's been taken away, that he doesn't look at us the same. Instead, when God looks at me and you, if you're in Christ, he sees his son. He looks at us the same way, that Jesus has imputed that righteousness on me and on you. And because of that, we have an opportunity today that as sons and daughters, we can go to our Father in full assurance of faith. Keep going down at verse 15. He'll show us. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he's continued to unpack this idea of how Jesus is different, how he's better than those high priests. He says, we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness. You see, the other high priests could sympathize of the Old Testament because they were weak. They were all broken men. That's why they had to go offer a bull for their own sacrifices. They weren't high and uppity leaders in the temple thinking they were righteous. They said, nope, not righteous. I'm not. I have to go offer my own sacrifice because I've got a problem, is what the high priest would say. But Jesus is different because he said he can sympathize with us, yet he also said he's never sinned. That he's never sinned. So he understands us, but he understands us in a different way. It's not because he's walked in sin, it's because he's walked in this broken world and experienced the weakness that is our lives. A few weeks ago, before I'd gone on this first trip, I had a different perspective of overseas trips because this was actually my first overseas trip going anywhere. I've done some missions in Central America. I've gone to Mexico, Haiti, Belize, Nicaragua. All those are short little plane trips from the great state of Texas. And I've gone to Central America. I've done that international travel, but I've never truly gone across the pond. Well, last night I got back here 10 p.m. after 36 hours and five planes of travel. And now I know what international travel really is. And I view it differently because now I've come to understand a term that I always heard rationally was called jet lag. I used to think jet lag was for a bunch of wimps, honestly, because when I thought about it, maybe I'm too judgmental, but I'd know people that would come back, whether it be to church or in life, and say, how was your trip to Bora Bora? And they'd be like, oh, it's rough right now. I just need a nap so bad. I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry for you. I'm so sorry for you that you were in paradise and you need a nap. Or there would be others, you know, yeah, I just need some coffee. I'm like half dead, the jet lag. Scottish Highlands, you know, they got me. It was really hard. Paris, it was brutal. I'm like, oh, yeah, it was brutal. Real brutal, buddy. And I would just like to publicly repent because now I want you to know I get it. I get it. I repent of all my sin. I confess it that I've judged many people over the course of my lifetime. But today I can tell you, I understand. I understand. I understand it. And why? It's because I've experienced it. I can sympathize now differently. And the reason I can sympathize is because I've walked in it. That I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be hyped up on coffee and the Holy Spirit, and that's the only thing keeping you going. I know what it's like. And I never could have known that if I had not actually entered into it. And Jesus Christ knows what it's like. I hope you understand this. It's our second point. Jesus understands where you are at. He understands where you're at. And why? How do we know that? It's because he entered into it. He knows what it's like. 
This is why I could never trust another religion. Because every other religion is a bunch of normal dudes telling you about God. And what is Christianity? It's God coming down to earth to tell you himself. And he experienced it. He knows what your life's like. He experienced the full spectrum of humanity. When it says that he can sympathize with our weakness, it's not referring to him experiencing sin because Christ never sinned. That's what made him the perfect sacrifice. But what it means is that he experienced the full spectrum of humanity. Jesus Christ was tempted just as you and I. And I'll say like you and I with an asterisk, because when I'm tempted and you're tempted, we're tempted by people and circumstances. You know what he was tempted by? Satan himself. Satan came to Jesus, because he knew if I could tear this man down, he won't be the perfect sacrifice. Yet he was without sin. Jesus was tired. He would talk about how he wouldn't have, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head that he was tired and he would go to God for strength in those moments of weakness. He would pray and say, I need you to fill me back up. I'm running on fumes. Jesus was hungry. He was thirsty. He was sorrowful. He lost friends. If you think about it, it, it he, uh, Lazarus passes on in the Gospel of John, and when he talks with the sisters, what happens? Jesus grieves with them, that he's filled with tears. Many would contend that perhaps his own father, earthly father Joseph, died during his lifetime. Jesus experienced loss. Jesus experienced family drama. In John chapter 7, verse 5, we're told his brothers and sisters didn't even believe in him. Jesus was an embarrassment to his family. They didn't like him. They compared themselves to him, I bet, and realized we fall short, and they judged him, that he experienced all of those things. He was betrayed by his friends. Judas stabs him in the back. Peter denies him. He dealt with the dysfunction of friendships. He was taunted and belittled still to this day. He was mocked and gossiped about. And he was beaten and he suffered gruesome pain. Jesus understands where you're at. He understands it. He's already been there, done that. And why did he go there and do that? It's so that you and I could draw near to him and know that he understands. He understands where we're at. Jesus entered into the mess with us. And because of that, we have to be careful because what Satan always tries to do is the same thing that he did with Adam and Eve. He tries to convince us that he doesn't understand, that he's wrong, that he doesn't get where you're at. And too many Christians over the years have gone down slippery slopes. Some in this room, perhaps you've begun to blame God for whatever you're going through. You blame him. And it's the wrong attitude to have to blame God when God actually sent his son to go endure the same things you're enduring. How can you blame him when he actually became one of us? He didn't have to, but we're told he stepped off of that throne and emptied himself, taking on the form of man, being born into the likeness of man and became obedient even to the point of death. But Satan would drive a wedge and say, blame him, he doesn't get it. And Jesus says, yes, I do. Satan, sometimes he will lead us to take on a victim mentality. Why me, God? Why? Why am I the one suffering? Why am I the one dealing with this? I'm the only one. And the truth is, none of us in this room are victims. If we really were going to argue someone is a victim, it's Christ. Because Jesus didn't do any wrong. Yet he willfully set aside his privilege and he took on all the pains, all the suffering, all the sin, all of the issues of our lives he put on his shoulders yet he did so for the joy set before him we're told in, in the book of Hebrews some of us in this room we think we're the exception and this is what Satan will do he'll try to drive you in your temptation I've talked to plenty of men and women over the years they think they're the only ones dealing with that problem that they will justify their sin they'll justify the problems because no one else gets it you don't understand the pressure I'm under Jesus understands it. You don't understand how difficult my family is. Jesus understands it. You don't understand all the pressure, the stress, the pain, the suffering. Jesus understands it. He understands all of it. And if we fail to understand that, we start to play the victim. We start to say we're the exception. And you know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. 
Other people are experiencing the same pains you're experiencing today. The problem is when our pride leads us to a place to think that we're the only ones. And today what the author of Hebrews is saying is, Jesus gets it. Jesus gets it, and truth is there's a lot of people in this room that get it too if you'll actually put down your guard and talk about it. He gets it. And because he gets it, Jesus wants to help you. Go to verse 16. He says, let us then with confidence, so not reluctantly, not let's see if this works out, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. He says, let us then, why? Because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Because he does understand what we're going through. He's walked in human weakness. In light of those realities, he says, let us draw near to his throne. And I hope you hear me on this final point. Jesus wants you to draw near. He's invited you today to draw near to him. And we know he wants us to because he's experienced the things we've done and he likewise has paid that ultimate sacrifice in his blood. So he says, in light of that, come close. Come close to me. And this is such a big point because usually people that are high up there, they're hard to reach, that we can't get to them. We don't have the access I left Austin a week and a half ago, a couple days early for this trip. And I did so because that ice storm was coming. I was supposed to fly out Friday morning to get to Atlanta and begin my excursion to Africa. And I couldn't miss the flight in Atlanta early on Friday. I knew ice was probable on Friday, which ice did happen on Friday and Thursday. So I left on Wednesday night to beat the storm, get to Atlanta, so I don't miss my flight to Kenya. But I got there, and that Thursday I had to myself. I had truthfully nothing to do, and I was alone in a town not knowing anybody. So I had nothing to do in Atlanta, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to go see a little bit of Atlanta for this day. So I got out and did a bunch of touristy things, but then I also went to an Atlanta Hawks game that night. Matt Gillum actually recommended this. I was like, nah, I'm too cheap, but then I spent the money. I got on StubHub, and I looked on there. And I saw, yeah, there's tickets available. So I went to a basketball game downtown Atlanta. I go to the State Farm Arena, and I bought the pastor seat, the cheap seat. I bought the cheapest one I could find up in the mezzanine. And I spent the littlest amount of money I could, paid for my parking, I got in the arena, but because I had nothing better to do, I got there super early. I got there an hour before tip-off, and I got in there because I'm kind of weird. Some of y'all like sports. I just like watching them warm up. I don't know if any of y'all like that. Some people say, don't get me in that stadium till second quarter. I like getting in there way early. And I'm watching these guys warm up. But the problem was I was in the nosebleeds. I couldn't see them very well. There weren't many people in the arena, so I decided I'd just kind of scoot down a little closer. Got a little closer. That worked. I said, oh, I'll get a little closer. And move down a little further. Get a little closer. Grab a snack. And I just started inching my way closer to the court until I was near courtside. And I was thinking, it's a good thing I'm in Atlanta. I can break rules right now. Nobody in my church has seen me steal all these people's seats, but I'm just going down. And all of a sudden, I'm just a few feet from Trey Young, or Trey Young and from uh, Devin Booker and Chris Paul, and they're warming up, and they're just yards away. It's awesome. I'm right there until a guy said, sir, may I see your ticket? <laughs> and I said, no, you may not. No, you may not. <laughs> and I, I just turned around, and I went the other direction to the nosebleeds where I belonged for the rest of the night. But why would he not let me down there? It's because I didn't have access. I wasn't invited to be close to them because I couldn't pay for the ticket that it would take to get there. But Jesus Christ has paid for that ticket and you have full access to God today. And my question to you is, are you sitting in the nosebleeds when you've been invited courtside? Because this is what happens usually in Christian lives. Christians settle for so little, so little. How foolish would I have been if somebody offered me a courtside ticket and I said, no, I'm just going to pay my own way and sit up there in the nosebleeds. Yet this is what people do for their entire lives. They don't want to receive a free gift that will give them direct access to God to experience things they never could have experienced without it. And instead they say, no, nah, I'm just going to try to keep working at it myself and pay for it my own way. And they live far and distant from God when he's opened up the door for you to come in. 
And my question is, is God distant in your life? He might be distant because you've just been trying to pay for everything yourself, and you've never received that free gift of salvation. And if that is you, I just want you to hear me. You'll never do enough or be good enough, and you'll never get there. You'll never get there. I love you too much to make you think otherwise. You'll never get there on your own. But praise be to God that Jesus Christ, our great high priest, he already came and did it all for you. And today, maybe that's what you need to do is simply receive that VIP pass and say, I want to know him. I want to see him and experience him. And for others in this room, maybe you've already received it, but you've gone back up into the nosebleeds for some reason. You'd rather watch people play the game of Christianity versus actually experience Christ yourself. And I'm just here to tell you there's more power that you can experience in your life. There's more faith. There's more strength. There's more grace. There's more transformation. There's more knowledge and understanding. And God can do so much more in your life than he's doing right now. But it will only happen if you get out of the nosebleeds and you draw near with full confidence. And when you draw near, he's faithful. And he says, I want to give you all the grace, all the mercy to help you in this time of need. So does God feel distant in your life? If so, it doesn't have to stay that way today.